All right, church. Let's all stand together and worship the Lord. Too.
church. So good to be here this morning. I know today is going to be a great day in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Because one of the reasons is we have a baptism today, and that's always a good day. But this week is a special week. It's Thanksgiving week, so we have a lot of great things to be thankful for. And a baptism is one of them. Amen. Amen. So if we can get some guys to move the, uh, the, move the wall, get the wall out of the way. <laughs> While they're doing that, I do want to welcome everybody here this morning. If you're joining us for the first time here, you're joining us online. We're so glad to have each and every one of you here this morning. If it is your first time, if you'd like to slip up your hand and we'll just, uh, we have an usher in the back, give you a welcome packet. But I don't see anybody here this morning the first time, so we're glad to have everybody here this morning. And like I said, we have a baptism, so, uh-oh, that cable might be. Again, I always think about that old southern gospel song we used to sing growing up joshua fought the battle of jericho jericho and then you then the walls came tumbling down y'all remember that song i'm gonna sign the worship team y'all work that one up for me <laughs> before the end of the service well praise the lord it's good to see you this morning it is, isn't it great to be in the lord's house and to be together, I see so many wonderful smiling faces, and this is, a, this is a good way to really start a service. And today, we're blessed. We're going to observe both of the ordinance that the Lord left the church to do. So I'm excited about this. It's a teachable moment. The first one we're going to observe this morning is to follow the Lord as he's instructed us as believers, really commanded is a good word, he said, if you're going to follow me, be baptized. And the pattern of Scripture and the picture of, of the baptism is by immersion. That's why we do it this way, because it symbolizes the new birth. It symbolizes that the old man is dead, buried with Christ, and raised to walk in new life. And that's, that's the picture of this. And this morning, we're going to celebrate this uh, wonderful ordinance, and we have two to baptize today. This is Grace Coppinex. I want you to look at her. Isn't she pretty? She's, she's ready today, and this is Sister Sheila's grand, granddaughter, and uh, we've been looking forward to this for quite a while, just trying to work out a schedule, so I'm excited that today is her day, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions before we baptize. Grace, let me ask you, first of all, do you hate the devil? Yes. All right, and secondly, and then most importantly, is it your testimony today that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and invited him in to your life and given him control of your life as your Lord? Is that your testimony? Yes. Well, it's upon that genuine New Testament confession of her faith. It's a great privilege today to baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We put a little Jordan River water in there. And we're buried with Christ. And raised to walk in new life. Hallelujah. Now just stretch your hands towards grace. They brought them out in Acts 19. After Paul got to Ephesus. He laid hands on them. And he prayed for them that they would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we do as we follow scriptural pattern. Father we pray for grace today. We ask you, Lord, we know that you have great plans for her to give her a future, to give her a hope. And her life that you've mapped out and ordained is beautiful. And it's a wonderful life. It's a life of blessings for her personally and also for the kingdom of God. But, Father, to, to, to live a life and to follow the blueprint of God, we cannot do that in our strength. Because apart from you, we can do nothing. But you said you would send the Holy Spirit. 
And through him and through the power of the Holy Ghost from a high, we shall do all things through Christ. And so we pray now, Father, that you'd open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings on little grace. Fill her with your Holy Spirit. Break every bondage, every generational curse. I command you in the name of Jesus to be gone today. From the top of her head to the bottom of her feet today, Father. Baptize her, Lord God, in the power of the Holy Ghost with fresh fire and a fresh anointing. And empower her to be a great victorious servant. And we ask it and call it done in the name, the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a good shout of praise. All right. You can go back just like that. Help her out because it's a little slippery. And this next one. I'm going to try not to get emotional because I'm feeling a little emotional. I, we've been waiting for this for a while. And uh, I'm a believe, just go ahead and tell you, we're, we're, we should have done this a long time ago, Sister Mary. But we had some obstacles that we had to work through. But today it's going to happen. It's going to happen today. Let them, let them see that shirt. Isn't that a night? I love that. It is all about Jesus. This is Sister Mary Gallery. Just sit right there and look back this way. And get, let's get a picture, mate. Can I get in this one? Yes, sir. This is not tears of sorrow. This is tears of joy. Sister Mary is special. She's special to us here at River of Life. She's special to me as a pastor. She's a worker. She's a servant. She's first one here, and she stays till everything's done. And, you know, we couldn't do, and I couldn't do what I do and without in this church without servants. And God has blessed us with so many. She's one, and she is a very big blessing in my life and the life of River of Life. And again, this day we've been talking about it and looking forward to it, and today it's finally here. Today, Sister Mary is being water baptized. She's been desiring this a long time, too. Oh, those tears are not sorrow. Those are tears of joy today. Sister Mary, do you hate the devil? I really do. Do you renounce him? <laughs> yes, I do. Amen. Amen. Do you look for, I'm, go, I'm just going to go ahead and make this one a quiz. Do you look forward as your pastor does to the day when Jesus kicks his butt into the bottomless pit and we stand there and shout, look, he's gone, he's gone. <laughs> Amen. Oh, is it your testimony today that you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your personal Savior and you've made him the King and Master and Lord of everything? Is that your testimony? Yes, it is. It's upon that genuine New Testament confession of your faith. It's my great joy and a privilege as a minister of the gospel to baptize you finally. <laughs> my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we're buried with Christ. And buried with Christ. Praise the Lord. It finally happened, didn't it? Hallelujah. All right, y'all stretch your hand to water. Father, thank you for this very special day, this very special event. Lord, we feel you already. We're not asking you to anoint or baptize. That's already happening. I feel it. We just rejoice that it is happening, and we receive it, and we stand amazed in your presence. Father, I know this sister has been powered by the Holy Spirit, but greater works are still to come. Father, you're going to give her a double portion today. We receive that in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a shout. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. It's always special to have a baptism, but I know that one was extra special. Amen. All right, well, let's continue on with this good worship and this good service this morning. If we get our ushers, I know we've got a couple of guys moving the wall back. If we can get our ushers to come to the front, and we'll continue on with our worship through giving. Have you guys come to the front to bring your tithes and offerings, but if you don't want to do that, or if you don't have any cash or check, you can just tithely online or on your phone or your tablet or any way you, can, you want to. You can text the internet and uh, you can give through, uh, through that credit card. It doesn't have to be a credit card. But let's go ahead and pray and uh, we'll continue to worship. But we just thank you so
so much, God, for this service that we're already having, Lord. We thank you for uh, for new life in you, Lord, and, and we thank you for the baptism and that that uh, that outward symbol that we can show people that you have truly, genuinely changed our lives, Lord. So I just pray that as we continue in this service, Lord, your Spirit will come lead us in this place, Lord, and that we'll just have a special moment, a special time with you, Lord. That we'll learn from your Word, God. And I pray that will just remind us to, to be thankful. offering. I pray for the gift and the giver. We ask this in your name. Amen. You guys can come in the front.
He loves Thanksgiving. He's comfortable in that environment. So let's be, let's make him comfortable. He's here. Let's make him comfortable in this environment by filling this room with wonderful praise and thanksgiving. I love that old hymn that says, count your blessings, name them one by one. Let's do that right now. And I'm going to ask you, I'm going to challenge you. I know many times we're in church and we we don't want to disrupt or disturb and cause confusion. You know, when everybody's talking at the same time, that's confusing to me. But I'm not God. It does not confuse him. him. And so I want you to audibly begin to count your blessings and fill this room with praise and thanksgiving. If you're saved, number one ought to be, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. So begin to just, let's, let's just, everybody, I'm going to challenge you to come with just 10, 10 blessings you're thankful for today. Call them out. Shout them out today. I thank you, Lord, that you've saved my soul. Come on. Thank you, Lord, that you did not leave me as an orphan. You sent the Holy Ghost in me to seal me, on me to fill me with power. Thank you for our church, Father. Thank you for this opportunity even today to gather and worship you. Thank you for the miracles that you're going to do today. Lord, I know you're not finished. Thank you that it won't be long. What we see by faith one day soon we'll see with our eyes. We'll see you as you are. Thank you, Father, all this in heaven, too. Thank you, Lord, I'm not going to hell. Thank you, Father, for getting me up this morning. Thank you for healing my diseases and sicknesses. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Go back to that uh, first song that uh, thank you for the blood. Let's sing that chorus together. Sing it again. Jesus for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus. It has washed me white.
just thank you so much for all the, all the wonderful things that we have, Lord. We ask this in your name. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Worship team, thank you. And um, how many of you remember old Jerry Clower? <laughs> what was his saying? Ain't God good. Now, I know our English teachers don't like that, but that's all right. Sometimes you just got to say ain't. <laughs> ain't God good. Can I get a witness in the house today? He's been good to me, and he's good, and he's a good God. Just a few moments, I want to direct your thoughts. Robert, if you could, my, my glasses, I'm going to look like Ray Charles up here. I have those transitional lens, and if those lights don't come down a little bit, I'm going to look like Ray Charles pretty fast. And I can't see y'all lick, it's so bright up here. Is my head shining this morning? If they leave those lights on that, I'm going to have to send somebody to get me a do-rag, just... just just to help your comfort level a little bit this morning. You're going to need some Ray Charles glasses if I don't. There we go. That's perfect. I look better now. If you turn all the lights off and it got totally dark, then I would look really good. <laughs> if you've got a good imagination. But I want to talk a few minutes before we come to this wonderful table of the Lord together and fellowship with the Lord and communion with Him. I want to talk to you since this is that week that we've set aside a day once a year in America, to have what we call Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is important. It's important in the natural, but it is highly important in our spiritual walk with the Lord. We cannot make too much or too big a deal over Thanksgiving. So give me just a few moments. I want to talk to you on that subject. First of all, here's something that I just want you to think with me for a moment. Thanksgiving is a learned behavior. Now, now, I'm going to let that just soak in just for a moment. It's a learned behavior. It is not part of our nature. We're born with a sin nature. We're born in sin. And one of the marks of that sin nature is selfishness. How many of you have, have had a new baby brought into your life, into your house? That is the most unthankful creature on the planet. The, the, the sacrifices we make, and the, hey, this goes both ways. The sacrifice we make when we have a child should remind us the sacrifice that our mom and daddy had to make. But babies and children come here like with their, their hand around life, mine, give me. And when things don't go just like they want them to go, then that's not fair. But children are not by nature thankful. So we as parents, if you're going to parent properly, you're going to teach Thanksgiving. You're going to teach them how to be grateful. At least that, that was the way it used to be done when I was growing up. If someone gave you something or did something good for you or sacrificed for you, you had to say thanks. Have you ever heard this conversation when someone gave little Johnny a special treat and mom and daddy says, now what do you say, little Johnny? He's too big. What do you say, little Johnny? Thank you. We have to teach them Thanksgiving is something that has to be taught. Now, this is important to make the transition. God desires and demands his children to be thankful. That we live with gratitude. Hmm. I've said this before because... Most of the times, we, when we think about sin, the sins that we commit, that's what we think about, the sins that we commit. So most of our thoughts and definition and defining and understanding of sin is I did something bad. I messed up. And we all have sinned and messed up and come up short. But you know, I think 
especially for those of us who've been doing this a long time as we're maturing and being discipled and becoming more like Christ. I battle more with not just committing sins, the act of the sin, but I, most of the time my biggest struggle with, is with sins of com- omission. Commission is we did something we weren't supposed to do. Omission is when we don't do something that we should do. We tend to fluff those off as unimportant or not even enough to think about. I just got enough on this side to keep me busy in repentance. But I think many times we come up short. And we live with shortages. We don't have the fires of revival. And the open window of heaven being poured out blessings on our life like God wants to do. Because we keep coming up short on this side. Things that we should do that we're not doing. And certainly, when it comes to living out thanksgiving, We have a deficit. We need to deal with this side. How many blessings? Look, look. What do you call a child who's ungrateful and unthankful? Let me tell you what I call them. Spoiled. (laughs) They've just gotten used to having everything they want in the pampered lifestyle. They just expect it. Well, it's always been that way. It'll always be that way. Maybe I'm wrong. But it's my evaluation as I look at my life. And as I look at those of us, especially down here in the South in the Bible Belt, especially Americans, American Christians, we're spoiled. And so many days we live with sin in our life, the sin of ingratitude. thought about this too uh, scripturally speaking and I'm, I'm going to give you some scripture today but, but some of this is just coming from some of the great lessons that I've learned in life I didn't learn in a school setting I learned over a coffee cup with someone who's lived a long time old people know some stuff because they've been through some stuff And I know that, so a lot of of what I'm dealing with in my life and and trying to adopt a life of thanksgiving, I'm picking up on these things from the Christian walk and the natural walk. But here's something scripturally that you need to understand today. And this is complicated. I could spend a lot of time with this because he never leaves us nor forsakes us. Do you believe that? He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's with us. But there's this, there's this, I'm just, the only way I can uh, explain this is in marriage. When you're married, you can live in the same house with somebody and them be there all the time and still not be Walking together. Here's the word I'm going to drop into your mind this morning. Intimacy. You see, you can be married, living in the same house, and never experience intimacy in that relationship. That's the beauty. That's the good part. Think back when you fell in love and when you, when you, when, 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 when you got married and you went on your honeymoon. I'm telling you what, intimacy was good. It was important, but yet we drift, and we lose that intimacy. And listen to me today, that God is always in the house. He'll never leave you. 
But that best part of the Christian life is, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy, the joy of intimacy. If you want to have that intimacy with God and and interact with him and intersect with him and to know him, that's what Paul said, I want to know him. I don't want to just go to church and talk about him and hear people sing about him. No, I want to know him. I want to get so close that I can feel his breath and his pleasure. I want to know him. Let me tell you many times. See, 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 he's always there. But thanksgiving, gratitude, appreciation, that attracts him, that brings him in close. I want God attracted to my life. I don't want him to have to be living, walking with me, holding his nose. This is a stinky life. No, I want him to be comfortable. When I'm at church, Or when I'm sitting in my house watching television. I don't want him grieved. And so many times because of a spoiled, unconscious, ungrateful mind and life. He says, you go on in there, I'll stay in here. I ain't leaving the house, but you sleep in your room, I'll be over here. No, I want him to say, I'm coming on in. Listen, God loves praise and thanksgiving. The psalmist said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lay and serve the Lord with gladness. Come come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now here's, if you want to you connect with him, you want to go into the holy place, you want to do like David did, just get in there and lounge around in the presence of the Lord. Enter with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. And bless his name. And then he didn't have to do it. But he said, you know, that should not be hard. Because God is good. The Lord is good. His mercies are new every morning. And they're never going to run out. They're everlasting. And he's truth. He cannot lie. That means the promises are yes and amen. Never mislead you. For every generation, what he did back to Moses and Abraham and Paul and Silas, he's doing it today. He's the same God. In her with thanksgiving. Be thankful. But the Bible also, on the flip side of that, talks about propelling God, stiffen him, keeping him at a distance, and that's ingratitude. Ingratitude does that. Listen, listen to Romans one twenty one. You know this passage. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, and neither were thankful. And then what did God say? He gave them up. He gave them up. He said, Y'all just stay over there. Because if you're gonna come here and we're gonna connect, be thankful. Be thankful. Ingratitude is one of the clear marks of the last generation, this generation that we're living today. Paul wrote to Timothy, says, I think it'll be probably Timothy, I don't know exact date, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it'll be around 2022 20, or 23. The perilous times will come. Here, here, here's, here, here how you're going to know that we're getting to the end of that. Men will love themselves covetous that is they're never satisfied they got the best but then something better comes along and then they want that never satisfied boasters proud blasphemers disobedient to parents watch this he slips this one right in there it's major unthankful unholy king james uses the word incontinent now that's not talking about you need adult diapers 
that word, uh, the word incontinent, incontinent means without self-control. You, you, let, me, let, me, let me give you a word to really describe this last generation. If you're looking for the definition of that word, addicted. They can't say no. Men and women are addicted to pornography, addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs, addicted to this. Addic- they've lost the incontinent. They're in no, the devil has completely taken charge of their flesh, and they just can't, no matter how hard they try, they just can't say no. Oh, I'm not going to do that ever again. Oh, my God, I did it. Uh, what, what did Brittany say? Whoop, I did it again. So since Thanksgiving, have have we proven scripturally and from experience today that we need to make much of this word Thanksgiving? It's a big word in the Bible. It's an important concept more than a turkey a year or parades or football, whatever, whatever you think about when you think about Thanksgiving Day. You need to think about, boy, this is a this is important. Thanksgiving. Being great, gr- grateful for God is important. So let me teach you how to be thankful. Three important lessons, and I'm not going to ta- keep you long. We're going straight to the table. Three very important lessons about Thanksgiving. First of all, here's where if we're going to live a thankful life, which attracts God, and I tell you, <laughs> when you get God, you get all of him. And all that he has. That's what happened when Lolly and I got entered into a relationship. Everything she had, she brought into the relationship. I, this this uh, prenup agreement, that is not biblical. I, I, I just, I think that's the dumbest thing. That, that, to me, when you get a prenup agreement, that, that, that you're saying, this is probably not going to work. <laughs> so we're going to plan for failure. No, when you get married, you need to get your dictionary out and cut the word divorce out. Cut separation out. Cut failure out. Everything I have, that's what you say, all that my earthly possessions to thee I give. I would never be married. All I give except those things I listed in the lawyer's office the other day. And we, we, hey, we are the bride of Christ. The ceremony's coming, but we are already. It does not yet appear. But when I got saved, all that he had, I got. And so the first thing we recognize in this attitude of thanksgiving that God would be pleased with today is the first recognition and understanding is everything is from God. See, when we enter, when I enter into a relationship with God, I was the receiver. He was the giver. All that I have, I give to thee, Lord Jesus, and that ain't nothing. He gave me everything. Every blessing, even the very breath that I'm using to proclaim this word today is from God. Life, everything that we have comes from God. James said it like this, James 1, 17, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, and it comes down from the Father. They use the word lights, but if you look it up in the Greek, it's the word fire, the God of fire. When we see that throne, it's going to be just fire. When God shows up, there's fire. Moses heard a voice and he looked. It was coming from the what? Fire. Every good, everything that we have, even the very breath, the life that we have, my house, my car, everything belongs to him and it's come from him. Do we see that today? Everything you possess comes from God. And until we come to that realization and, 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 and truly believe that and understand that, we will never really be thankful. One of the chief enemies of thankfulness is pride. 
Well, I got to go to my job. I'm going to drive my car. I'm going to, this is mine. No, the earth is the Lord's. Just a quick reminder, we're not in ownership. We're in stewardship. We're just here for a few days to manage the blessings of God. How's that, how's that going for you? This has been a rough week. I know uh, pastors are not exempt from family issues and family problems, and uh, it's no secret. I've, we've been struggling with my dad, dementia. He's been going downhill really fast, and it's been a real struggle. Well, last Sunday, he fell and couldn't get out of the floor, and they wound up getting the ambulance, and they took him to the hospital. And um, his sugar was 600. He, he should have died in the floor. Confused. So they had him in the hospital, and we knew at that point he'd probably never come back home because the dementia is kind of advanced. And so that's, you know, I, was, I prayed so hard. Lord, may that trip to the hospital, the nursing home, wherever we have to put him, be in the back of an ambulance and not a police car. Because in his dementia, he, had, he was volatile and uh, threatened to hurt himself. So I had been praying so hard for that. And so God answered that prayer, and Dad's in a safe place. So my mother got sick, um, hasn't been able to, and she's still sick. She hasn't been able to eat. And now she's there by herself, barely able, hard-headed. Mom, if you're listening, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, you're hard-headed. You, you know, one of the hardest things I'm discovering about life is parenting your parents. It is unnatural. And as Maddie would say, that's not fun. And, and I said, Mom, you, I, let me tell you. Well, I got in my car, and I went over there, and, and I was there Wednesday, and I had gone to visit Dad. And I, I, I said, Mom, and, and every day, this, this started Monday when she got sick, and just everything's going straight through her, and she's dehydrating. Just wouldn't go. Wouldn't go to the hospital. My cousin Janice lives there in Boulder, Lucy. She's a nurse, and she, she's been there several times saying, Aunt Vivian, come on, let's go. I'm going to take you to the hospital. No, I'll be all. Here's what she said Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. I know that tomorrow I'll be better. And if I'm not better, tomorrow morning I'll go to the hospital. She said that every morning for three straight mornings. I said, Mama, you're not going to do it. You're going to sit right here until you die. Do you want to die? Well, finally, I, I, told her, I, I told her Thursday. I said, Mom, you're either, and Janice had been by. I said, Janice, you're either going to go with Mom or you're going to go with Janice to the emergency room and let them find out what's going on, or I'm going to call and 911 and have an ambulance come get you. There's no wiggle room. This, today is yesterday that you've been saying you're going to do something. So she said, no, don't do that, son, don't do that. And I said, oh, well, get up and go to the, well, I'm just, I'm cold. And I don't, I don't, I feel tired. I don't feel, st I said, well, let me call the ambulance. And finally she calls me an hour or two later because she knew I was about to call 911. And she said, okay, I'm getting up, Janice is going to take me. Well, they took her, she's got a, a kidney infection. And, uh, and really no better. And she's still not able to put anything on her stomach. She, it, the craziest thing, too, is that they took her to the hospital and gave her a prescription and sent her back home. My God, she needed to be in the ICU. At least, uh, well, anyhow, uh, I just keep praying for my family. Well, and another thing to bless the Lord, and just sometimes things, are, life is challenging. I thought I had enough on my plate then, and then Wednesday as I'm driving into Bogalusa, and Bogalusa is famous for the last few weeks, but gang wars are going on, shootings and killings. Even had one at the football game, and, and shootouts everywhere at any time, people getting caught in the crossfire. And so I'm coming into town, I'm talking to a friend on the phone, and all of a sudden I get to that part of town where the shootings happen most likely, where the gangs are live, and all of a sudden I heard a glass explode. In my car, I hit the deck. And I looked in the rearview mirror, and a truck had just passed me. My sunroof had exploded. Glass was just falling everywhere. I said, well, that's a blessing. <laughs> 
What is that stuff he said about in everything giving things? I'm, having, I'm struggling right now. And so here I am. It's cold. Cloudy. And I've got an open sunroof now with glass raining down on me. I don't know if it was a bullet. I don't know what it was. All I know is I got, a, I got an open sunroof. So we, I taped it up as best I could. I had a friend help me put a bag over and tape it up. And so that, that was my Wednesday. You see, maybe you wonder why I didn't make church Wednesday night. And then, and then I'm telling you this story. And then Wednesday, I, I just did everything I could. I went and visited and spent some time with my dad. Helped him have a lunch. Then I went, mother needed me to go. The truck was there at the hospital, so I had to take it back to the house. I had to get a friend to help me do that. Then uh, she needed me to do banking, and so she, I went to the bank for her, and she had written a thing for, uh, to get some cash so she'd have some money to spend. And then she, I asked her, if anything, what else can I do? And I said, she hadn't eaten. I said, let me go get some groceries. So I went to the grocery store, and I loaded up groceries and brought them back after the bank. And it, my mother was so adamant that she was going to give me some money for those groceries. I said, Mama, I am not. You need that cash because you don't know what tomorrow might bring. I'm not taking a dime from you. She says, Son, here, take this money. You've got, you've got to take this money. I said, I'm not going to take that money. And I told her this, and this ties me back to my message. This is the highway I'm coming back. I said, Mama, if I went to my bank, and got every dime I have. And if I sold all the things that I have and got cash for it and piled all that I have in one big pile and put it here at your feet, it wouldn't begin to pay the debt I owe for what you and dad have done for me for these 66 years. You see, that hit me. That's the type of life we should have. That's the type of attitude of gratitude that attracts God. Recognize where our blessings come from. Secondly, remember the blessings of God. Oh, my God, I could go all day on this one. One of my favorite psalms, and I've preached from this so many, many times. This is my sugar stick message. When I was in Brazil, you always had to have a sugar stick message because every 10 steps, Pastor Jim would stop and say, would you preach? I mean, you go to a car dealer to see people, cousins working at a car dealer, he's going to get everybody in a big pile, and I'm going to preach. You've got to be ready to preach. And so I had, a, I had a couple of three sugar sticks, it was according to the crowd, but this was, my, uh, this was my go-to, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. And forget not. Hey, let me make, make it possible. Remember, forget not the benefits. Oh, I talked about that already. Whew. When I got saved, what a blessing. Pride is an enemy of our gratitude, but carelessness is. That spoiled attitude, taking the blessings of God for granted. Someone once said that if the stars only came out once a year, we'd stay up all night to watch them. But they're there every night, so we've gotten used to it. When you go through a traumatic experience, and I, I, I've, I've gone through some trauma. I've had a, our Second and third child, Robert and Hannah, when they were born, we had Lolly and I's blood didn't match, and it was touch and go whether we were going to lose them because they had no platelets of blood. It was, why, it, it was a mess. It's real complicated, but that was traumatic. And, and just going through so many times, it's just life was traumatic. That's the only word I can come up with. But May the 29th, Actually, all the way back to March the 4th, 2020. That was the most trauma when we got the phone call about her brain tumor. And then May the 29th, when we stood and watched her take her last breath and go home. And, 
And what I've learned, and if you've been around me, I, I, I'm not going to apologize because I'm still crazy. Grief will make you crazy. So you're just going to have to put up with it. <laughs> you can run if you want to. And you can say, well, he just talks about Lolly too much. I need to. Yeah. It's therapeutic to me. Because one of the things that scares me the most is that we're going to get here one Sunday and we, we, we forgot about her. That is never going to happen. As long as I'm the pastor here, I'm going to remind you pretty regularly of my sweet Lolly. And I've, you, 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 life teaches you so many things. When you're going through the mountain experiences, you learn some lessons. When you're going through the valley, that's when you really learn. And so I have been very analytical of this new life that I'm forced to live. And if you've been around me, you've heard me speak of this a lot. And, and it's not just from the trauma. It's not just from losing someone that you love, though it'll always show up there. It's just the process of getting older. Because when you get older, you spend, you have more behind you than ahead of you. And then you, 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 you're more analytical about your life journey. You, you, you talk about it, and you think about it, and you analyze it. See, life does not give us mulligans. It's there, irreversible. It happened. It's done. It cost me. It affected me. It blessed me as we analyze it. Here's the word that keeps popping up in my grief and in, in this new life is the word regret. Regret. I'm telling you, you're never going to get from young to old and not get here and look back and not have regrets. It's impossible. We all have them. By definition, the word regret can be defined as a, a sorrow over a mistake, a failure, or Missed opportunity. Uh, maybe I could just say it like this. It, it, it's sins of commission and omission. I have regrets over the doggone stupid things I did that I wish I hadn't done. Then I wish I could get a mulligan. I, if I could get another chance. If I could do life again. If I could live that day again. Dad, gum it, I wouldn't do that. That cost me. That was an ouchie. But we also have those, man, what missed opportunity. Oh, I wish I could, get, I could go back and live those days again. I regret I didn't buy Disney stock. I regret I didn't take everything I have and go to the bank and borrow money to buy Walmart stock. <laughs> How about Amazon? You got billionaires because they bought Apple stock at the right time. We all have missed opportunities. We all have regrets over things we did do we shouldn't have done and things we didn't do that we should have. And I've been analyzing because uh, what I would give to go back and just have one more day with Lolly. And I thought back and I thought about this and I've analyzed this to, to, to probably to to unhealthy place because I keep replaying this. Where, where I have so many regrets, but what, where, what is the regret? What is it that's bothering me that I have regrets over? 36 years of being blessed with the greatest wife, mother. Most men, and women for that matter, on their deathbed, when they start talking about the regrets, it's, I, I, if I regret I didn't spend enough time with them. If I could go back, I wouldn't put so much emphasis on work. I would go back and Spend more time with my children. Spend more time with my wife. I regret. That's not my regret. Because it probably would have been physically impossible 
for Lolly and I to spend more time together. I know it wouldn't have been healthy. Because you can get on each other's nerves after a day or two of being in a closed up little spot. And she spent a lot of time over here and I spent a lot of time over there in my study. But we always ended up at the same place. She needed me. She couldn't turn the TV on without me. <laughs> she was, those of you who know, she was electronically challenged. <laughs> So I always knew that she wasn't going to run me off because she couldn't, wa she couldn't turn anything on without me. And I'm about that way, that way with washers, washing machines and, and dishwashers. Whitney, if it had been for Whitney, I'd still be washing my clothes and hanging them on the line. <laughs> and a matter of fact, I only know how to wash clothes one way. Whites and greens and purples, hot water, cold water. Whitney set it up, all I do is push one button. I put the right soap she told me to put in, I put the clothes in, and I push that one button, and it works. Same way with the dishwasher. But Lolly was worse than me. Every time I'd go on prayer retreat, I would always get the phone call. Well, this doggone TV, she'd have it so screwed up, I couldn't fix it over the phone. You know how many times did I say, Robert, I had to call Robert, Robert go, put Mama's TV on. How many of you like that to say, that's me, <laughs> that's me? How many of you used to have a VCR and the clock just blinked? <laughs> you know, that clock was in there so you could set timing so you could record stuff. You didn't know that. I'm, don't, don't forget I said that. But when it comes to my life and Lolly, the regret I have is not that I could have spent more time with her, though I would take a day right now and give everything for it. You know what my regret is? That in those days, I didn't appreciate what a blessing she was. Here, here's what we do. We take it for granted. We were just, we were floating along taking life for granted until that phone call in March. And what I would give to go back just any little thing that, that we call little things that we did. You know, every Sunday afternoon, unless we had to go to the hospital or something special, we'd go home right after church and make hamburgers. I'd grill hamburgers. In the evening, we'd sit out on the porch and drink our coffee. That was what we did. I hadn't been able to sit back on that porch since I lost her. It's dusty and dirty back there. I did clean it the other day, but I just don't have the heart to go back there and drink my coffee anymore. What I regret... It's one of those Sundays, if I could do it again, when we were in the kitchen for no reason. I just walked over there and grabbed her up in my arms and kissed her and said, I love you. Well, I did that when it was special occasions or when she told me she wanted me to. <laughs> so, 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 this is what I'm getting to. You can learn from old folks. This is a teachable moment. Especially you young marrieds and you old marrieds that you've been living together so long that you're taking each other for granted, that you're taking life for granted. What I'm going to try to tell you today is live in that moment. Appreciate the Lord for every moment of life. We, we were having, we, uh, last Saturday was my birthday, and Pastor Junior was here, and my kids, we went to the steakhouse and had a little birthday meal and just a little fellowship, and Pastor Junior even said that. He said, you know, we need to mark this. This is, this is never going to happen again, and this is, this is important in my life. So let's make, let's make a, let's put a memorial marker right here and appreciate what we have. We're so busy worried about what we missed yesterday and what we got to do tomorrow that we miss this moment. I would just say, husbands, love your wives. Not just on Valentine's Day. Oh, what I would give just to buy her, go buy her flowers for no reason. No special occasion. No Hallmark holiday. Hallmark keeps holidays on the calendar because they want to sell cards. That's my regret. And here's where I'm at in my life with these 66 years I've lived. Whatever he gives me ahead, I'm trying to get up every day and be cognizant, conscious that today I want to live my life 
spend my time and resources and try to eliminate regrets. I've had enough. Going forward, I want to get to the end of this thing and say I have no regrets. I have a lot of regrets, but as we begin to come to this table, as we prepare now for this great time of communion with the Lord, what a, what a, what a powerful, wonderful thing communion is with the Lord, the Lord's table, such a spiritual event. So begin to prepare yourself if you haven't already. I have so many regrets over these 66 years, but I thought it might be appropriate for me just to call off a few things I don't regret. I got more regrets behind me than I have no regrets, but there are some things I don't regret. You know one thing I don't regret? As a seven-year-old boy at the Calvary Baptist Church, that Sunday when I heard the gospel and the Holy Ghost called me to Jesus. I don't have any regrets that Sunday morning. I left my seat and I came down that aisle, put my hand in the pastor's hand, and he led me in a sinner's prayer. I don't regret that Sunday morning. I opened my little heart up and said, Jesus, come in and save me. Oh, no, not one moment, not one day, not, not in even an instant. No, have I ever regretted that. That's the greatest decision I've ever made, and I've made a few good decisions. What a difference he made in my life. The only regret I have is I got saved at seven. It didn't happen at six. Why didn't he, why didn't he save me younger? Because I, I, the first time he called, I said, yep. I don't understand why people would put Jesus off. Man, the greatest thing you'll ever do is get a personal relationship. Hey, and say, yeah, oh, heaven, yeah. That, uh, no, I'm talking about the greatest decision is, 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 is having him now. And heaven too. I don't regret that. I don't regret just nine years later from that day I gave my heart to Jesus, I don't regret nine years later at 16 when he put a call on my life to be a full-time minister, a full-time preacher of the gospel. I have no regret. It's been tough. But I'm like the old happy good man. I wouldn't. You, no, no, no. I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. <laughs> you know who wrote that? I thought the Goodmans wrote it. Governor Jimmy Davis. <laughs> I'm finding out just about every song I like he wrote. I wouldn't take nothing for my journey. Now, I'm going to make it to heaven somehow. <laughs> Amen. I, hey, I, 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 don't, I don't regret nine years later saying yes. And I don't, here's another non-regret. I don't regret not one single moment for these past 25 years when I accepted the call to be the pastor of the Port Vincent Baptist Church, later to be known as the River of Life Worship Center. We've had some tough days, but I don't regret even the tough days. I love this place. I've asked the Lord, and this might scare you to death, but I've asked the Lord all the way through these 25 years, Lord, let me finish here. I don't own, I'm not in ownership. I'm just go where he sends me. But I, he said, make your request known. So I asked him, let me go out of here like Brother Dwayne did, right? Brother Jerry did, Brother Huey did. Hey, as Lolly did, let me go out of here in a box. Let me preach my last sermon. Oh, hey, even better than that, let's go together at a trumpet sound. Hey, I'm listening. May I not to come, Lord Jesus. I don't regret, and I tell you what, I can't thank you enough for all that you've done for me and my family over these 25 years. I just, there's not enough words and adjectives in the dictionary to tell you how much I appreciate you and love you and thank God for you. Thank you, church, for being exceptional, exceptional. Old B.B. Bikini, our Louisiana born and bred, filled up that hymn book, but one of my favorite old B.B. Bikini uh, and I preached up there not too long ago, right there where he's from. And he said it like this, and I amen, old BB. I am satisfied with Jesus. He has done so much for me. He suffered. He suffered on that cross to redeem me. He died to set me free. How about the second verse? He is with me in my trials. Hey, hey Wednesday, oh my God, I, I said, I need you, Jesus. When they started shooting at me. 
I don't know what happened. Maybe we'll find out because I pulled that little thing, that little window thing, that, and I pulled, made that tight. And so hopefully whatever went through that window is still trapped up there, and we'll figure it out. I did. I got a police friend. I told him, I said, something happened. Some, either, you know, somebody could have shot up in the air, and it, what goes up has to come down. I don't know what happened, but it got my attention. But he's with me in my trials. Hey, I like this. Listen to this. Best of friends of all he is, is he. Of all is he. I can always count on Jesus. Can he always count on me? I am satisfied. I am satisfied. I am satisfied with Jesus. But the question comes to me when I think of Calvary. Is my master satisfied with me? Recognize the blessings. Worship team, if y'all come get in place. Recognize the blessings. Remember the blessings of God. Just two, two primary verses on Thanksgiving. I'm going to read this and we'll go into the invitation. He said, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks. This is God's will. You want to know the will of God? It starts right there. Be thankful. Ephesians 5.20, Giving thanks always for all things. Because why? He causes all things to work together for good. It may not be good in the moment. That medicine may taste bad. Those braces may hurt. But he's going to bring good out of it if you'll just trust him. You see, what is the proper response to Thanksgiving? That's the question I want to pose as we go into this altar call. What is the proper response to Thanksgiving? To the, to the goodness of God, to the blessings of God. I want to change a word because most of the time we would answer that question. The proper response to the goodness of God and the blessings of God is for us to give thanks. No. It's easy to give thanks. You know what the proper response is? Reciprocity. Not to give thanks, but to live thanks. He's not, he's not so concerned about your words. He wants to know what's going on in your heart. You can say, I vow a vow, and I love you, Lord, and your heart be far from you. I thought about coming to this table. I heard a, I heard a story that years ago, and I was reminded of it this past week, it was during the World War II. By the way, young people, back in the, those days, they didn't have the internet <laughs> or cell phones. You were probably very wealthy and rich if you had an own phone line in your house with a 100-foot cord <laughs> without a party line. Do you remember party lines? My uncle lived in the country, and every t that, that was the neatest thing as a kid. They'd had a party line. You had to pick up the phone and see if anybody was on the phone. Anybody could know your business. One at a time. I'll be off in a minute. Those are the good days, aren't they? <laughs> That's Andy Griffin stuff there. <laughs> Communication was hard. And so mothers and fathers and families would send their children to the battlefield. And for weeks, sometimes months, they heard nothing. Every day, what's going on? Is my child still alive? Man, bodies were dropping. It was a world war. And can you imagine that mother and father every day wondering when they went to the mail, would that letter be in there? Or wondering when someone knocked on the door, would it be someone dressed in a soldier's military with a chaplain. Will I get that news? And every day praying, God, bring my child home. This one particular family, the boy, they hadn't heard from him in weeks. It was getting close to Christmas. And they prayed for him and wanted, whoa, what would be, what would be such a blessing to have him ha here with us at Christmas, at, the, at his place, at the table. And a few weeks, a few days before Christmas, the phone rings. 
And guess what? It's him. He said, Mama, I'm back on American soil and I'm going to, I'm coming for Christmas. She just went crazy. He said, but can, can I ask a favor? He said, I got a friend. And he can't be with his family. And he has no one. Would it be all right, Mom, if I brought him home with us, with me, and he said, have Christmas with us? Said, oh, yes. Well, wait, 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 Mother. I got to tell you, he got, he got injured pretty bad the other day. He's lost an eye. He lost an arm. And he lost a leg. Is it okay? Pause. A big pause. Well, son, I think it would be better if you left him there in the hospital. He needs therapy, and we're just, we're just not set up to handle that type of situation, and that would be such an inconvenience, son. Don't bring him. Okay, Mama. He hung up. A few days later, a suicide note was found. A body was identified. It was the body of their own son. And when they raised the lid of the casket, the mother looked down at the body of her son and saw he had one eye gone. One arm was gone. And one leg was gone. Don't bring anybody like that home. My friend, 2,000 years ago, Jesus looked down at us. Scarred with sin. Crippled by sin blinded by sin and instead of looking at me as an inconvenience and the cross is an inconvenience said, come on home son I'll take you just as you are that's grace folks that's amazing grace Isaac Watts, I quote this so often and usually right here at the table because these are some of the greatest words ever penned in a hymn that Fanny Crosby didn't write. He was just contemplating what I just talked about, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the goodness of God. And his heart was so full of thanksgiving that he wrote these immortal words. When I survey that wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain, I, oh, I just count that all as loss and pour contempt on my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should ever boast. If I'm going to boast, let it be about you, Jesus. And the cross did it. All the vain things of this world that charm me most, I sacrificed them here to your blood. Then that moving third verse, see, from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love or sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? What's the proper response of the goodness and the grace and the mercies of God? Well, he wrote it clear here. Were the whole realm of nature mine, if I owned every, if I was the king of the universe and all the wealth of this whole world, I had control over it. I could take it. And if I brought it all and laid it at your feet, that would still be a present far too small. Why? Your love is so amazing. It's so divine. Hey, what does that mean? Is it God, it's God's love. That means I can't comprehend it. I can't duplicate it. I can't love like it's God's love. It's unfathomable. Love so amazing, so divine. Here's the proper response. I'm going to stand here and with my lips give you thanks. No! Here, Lord, I give thee all. Oh. oh. That love demands my soul, my life, my all. Have you done that? Considering what he's done for us, it's the least that we can do to become living sacrifices. That's what he's looking for instead of a thank you, Jesus, for this food. Bless it to nourish my body. No, from a heart of gratitude. Let every beat of my heart 
Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Slip to your feet. As we come to the, prepare for this table, he says, don't come unworthily. That means everything that we've ever done needs to be repented of and, and confessed and forsaken. Come to the fountain filled with blood. Right now, just open your life before the Lord and begin to say, Lord, I have sinned against you. Forgive me. And you might know specifically what it is or you just want from head to toe say anything. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, all that's with me. If there's anything in me that doesn't bless you, that grieves you, I want it out today. I confess it and I forsake it. Come out. Let Him wash you today. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's face. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilt and stay. You need healing. The atonement, not only is there forgiveness and life in the blood, but through that atonement, the, the, the psalmist said, the blessed Lord, oh my soul and all this women, forget not his benefits. He forgave all my sins. He's healed all my diseases. He's crowned me with love and light, loving kindness. His, he's, he's delivered me from, from anything, from the horrible pit today. Everything you need today is found in Jesus. Would you come and say, I, whatever it is, just come down here and find, link up with one of these prayer partners and say, I need, a, I need a touch from God today for whatever it is. Call it out right now as we prepare for this table. Do what he tells you to do right now. Counselors, would you join me here at the beginning? At the front? Sing of his goodness. That Passover upper room night. The Bible says that he took that bread and he broke it symbolically. He says, this is my body. When you, when you think of me, when you take this bread, when you, when you put this in your hand, pause and remember, my body, not your body, my body should have been broken. I should have been crucified. I should have suffered. I should be in hell. But he led his body, God, became a man. He gave his body. He was broken. He said, be thankful. Take it, eat it, and remember me. Thank you, Lord. And that same night, he took the cup and he said, my body's going to be beat up and my blood's going to be poured out. You're going to witness it. History's going to see it. It's going to be public. But until I come, I want you to come back to this table as often as you do. And when you take that cup, you remember that precious blood. My blood was shed for you. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. Take it, drink it, and remember Jesus.